Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to the first episode of the maritime section of the WFW transport webinar series. This is um, a three-part series with, uh, with the first episode today. Before we get going, I'd like to um, uh, sort of start with some housekeeping notes. You should note that all participants, the video and audio of all participants, has been uh, disabled during this webinar. However, if you'd like to raise any questions uh, to our pres to to the presenters or or make a comment, you should use the Q and A function at the bottom of your sort of in the middle at the bottom of your screen. And what we will do is we'll either respond to the, the questions you may ask um, uh, in writing, or we can I can highlight some key points uh, at the end of the um, webinar and raise those with the presenters themselves. So there will be a Q&A uh, session at the very end of the, the presentations. And finally, you should also note that the webinar is going to be recorded. Um, my name is uh, George Paliprasas and I'm uh, the co-head of the global maritime sector at WFW. And we've decided to, to run this webinar and it's uh, focusing on topical issues within the maritime sector. Uh, we're proposing to run these one hour sessions uh, with fairly brief presentations, but identifying very, very topical issues, especially at a time when there is significant change and flux within the maritime sector, with a big, big push towards sustainable shipping and also uh, financial pressures and a lack of financing as well, as well as, of course, what we're all facing around the world in terms of the effect of the pandemic, which has created a fairly unprecedented situation. I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers today. Uh, we will start with Daniel Pulaski, a partner in our New York office, who will uh, talk about U.S. sanctions, uh, a subject he knows he knows about very very well. But he will focus on what's new in terms of um, the U.S. sanctions. Then. We will have Evangelos Katsambas from, from our office here in Athens, who will talk about force majeure and frustration in commercial and shipping contracts. And then we will close off with Kavita Shah and Gary Walsh, who are partners in our London office, and they will provide an update regarding ship finance and um, focusing on changes in the market and documentation. So I'd like to hand over now to Daniel. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you, everyone, for dialing in. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening from wherever you are. Um, uh, as George mentioned, my topic today is US sanctions, what's new? Um, and what I mean by that is really I'm going to be focusing on changes to the US sanctions program uh, over the past one year or so. Uh, by necessity, this uh, I will be assuming a basic familiarity with the structure and framework of US sanctions. Um, but certainly, as, as George mentioned, uh, if there's anything I say that is unclear uh, or that you're not familiar with, please feel free to, uh, to ask your questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and I'm also happy to discuss further after this webinar. Uh, so jumping right in, I wanted to start with uh, Iran, secondary sanctions, and uh, maximum pressure. Uh, as a little bit of background, in, uh, in the early uh, 2010s, uh, culminating in 2015, uh, there was a lot of negotiation, uh, which culminated in the JCPOA, or the Iran nuclear deal, uh, which lifted most U.S. secondary sanctions on Iran and some primary sanctions, uh, along with uh, UN and EU sanctions. Uh, a little bit of terminology, when I say primary and secondary sanctions, primary sanctions 
Maine, we target uh, U.S. persons, uh, prevent U.S. persons from dealing with Iran, where secondary sanctions really are, uh, are about non-U.S. persons. Uh, and they're obviously of, uh, of great importance to the, uh, the international shipping community. Um, so the JCPOA went into effect in uh, January 2016. Uh, and then we had the election of President Trump. In 2018, uh, President Trump pulled out of the JCPOA completely. Um, and uh, essentially set back the clock and restored uh, all of the sanctions that had been lifted. Uh, and as we will see, he actually went quite a bit further. Um, what, uh, uh, but in addition to, uh, to actually imposing the sanctions, uh, under President Trump, uh, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, which is the main U.S. sanctions authority, uh, has embarked on a campaign of maximum pressure, that's their term, uh, against Iran, uh, and uh, essentially what that really means is, uh, is, is kind of what it sounds like, being very aggressive in enforcement, uh, uh, um, uh, even, even with respect to small violations and, uh, and, and very much uh, uh, trying to stop people from dealing with Iran. Uh, and we saw this uh, uh, come to fruition essentially uh, on September 25th, 2019, uh, when OFAC imposed sanctions on Costco Dalian, uh, which is a subsidiary of Costco, the uh, large Chinese conglomerate. Uh, there were several other Chinese companies that were sanctioned as well, but Costco Dalian was certainly the, uh, the big one. Uh, and what we saw was uh, was chaos. Um, the the effect was immediate. No one could deal with any of these companies, uh, or, or or there was uncertainty whether anyone could deal with any of these companies. There was uncertainty as to even which Costco entities were sanctioned. Um, about a month after the sanctions were imposed, OFAC belatedly issued a general license, which permitted some level of trading with these companies, uh, with, uh, with these Costco Dalian companies. I think uh, even OFAC was not uh, was not prepared for the uh, the blowback that their actions would take. Uh, and finally, on January 31st uh, of this year, Costco Dalian was removed from the sanctions list. Uh, its management affiliate and some other companies remain sanctioned, um, um, but essentially it's, it's, we're, we're kind of back to where we started. But we really do see the effect in this example of what sanctions can do to the shipping community. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, Trump has gone beyond what was uh, 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 the, the pre-JCPOA sanctions. Uh, in January of this year, uh, OFAC imposed additional sanctions on other sectors of the Iranian economy. Um, uh, already sanctioned had been oil and gas, maritime ports, et cetera, a lot of the, se the uh, sectors that the maritime community is concerned with. Um, but now we have construction, mining, manufacturing, and textiles. Uh, we had some uh, uh, dispute at the UN just last month, uh, which isn't really that relevant for, uh, for us. Um, but then just uh, on October 8th, just one week ago, uh, OFAC designated the entire Iranian financial sector as subject to sanctions. Uh, to secondary sanctions. And what that means is essentially any payment uh, to or from uh, any Iranian bank or financial institution is potentially subject to secondary sanctions. Um, and obviously that's, uh, that, that's devastating to the Iranian economy to the extent that the, uh, the Iranian economy was not already devastated, which it largely was. Uh, technically there remains a, a humanitarian exception uh, and payments for food and medicine and other humanitarian items can be processed. Um, but most banks at this point, uh, if, if they weren't already dealing with Iran, will, will stop dealing with Iran. Moving on, uh, uh, the next uh, country, which is the, uh, the focus of, of also a U.S. sanctions maximum pressure campaign is Venezuela. Uh, the Venezuelan sanctions uh, began a few years ago, but they really took full force in effect, I'd say, in, uh, in January of 2019, uh, when OFAC imposed sanctions on PDVSA, the uh, state-owned oil company. Um, in April of, that, uh, of 2019, uh, several companies were sanctioned for shipping Venezuelan oil to Cuba, uh, and, uh, and additional sanctions followed. I think a lot of people were hopeful that Either that was some sort of one-off, or maybe it was, uh, or maybe it was uh, had to do with Cuba and shipping Venezuelan oil to other places would, would still be permissible. Um, but I, I think what we've seen since is uh, is more and more companies have been have been sanctioned for dealing with uh, with Venezuela. In February, uh, 
of 2020, uh, Rosneft, the Russian oil giant, had been doing a lot of business with Venezuela, and uh, one of their trading affiliates was was sanctioned. Two of their trading affiliates were sanctioned, and they've effectively had to step back from that. Uh, and finally, and, and most recently, uh, in June, uh, six Greek managed or or Greek managed or Greek affiliated tankers uh, were added to the sanctions list for trading in Venezuela uh, in Venezuelan oil uh, or or other or other oil products. Um, they were delisted shortly thereafter, uh, after an intense round of lobbying and, uh, and promises to cease business with Venezuela. Um, but what we've seen in Venezuela, as we saw uh, in Iran before, is, uh, is really an effort of the U.S. to, uh, to shut down the entire international community uh, from working with Venezuela and dealing with Venezuela. Uh, and this has been largely successful in that uh, Venezuelan oil output is essentially at an all-time low. I wanted to talk a little bit about Syria, uh, perhaps a little bit less important in a, uh, uh, in a uh, um, uh, shipping community sense, um, but, but still certainly a, uh, uh, um, uh, a source of, of uh, some business. Um, the Syrian sanctions campaign essentially dates to 2011, to the beginning of the, uh, the Syrian civil war. Um, and unlike what we saw in, in Iran and Venezuela recently, for a long time, the Syrian campaign was, was very much a primary sanctions campaign. So most U.S. persons couldn't do business with Syria, um, but non-U.S. persons generally could. So there were always some exceptions, but, um, but certainly normal trades of goods to and from Syria were permitted under U.S. sanctions. Um, that changed in, in December of last year. Uh, Congress and uh, the U.S. Congress passed a law, the Syria, Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act. Uh, the name Caesar refers to the pseudonym of a uh, of a Syrian photojournalist who documented various atrocities in Syria. Um, and essentially, this imposes mandatory sanctions on non-U.S. persons. So these very much are secondary sanctions aimed at the, the international community. Uh, who engage with the Syrian government in relation to uh, the military, no, no surprise there, but then the oil and gas and construction and engineering sectors. So obviously uh, those, are, those are very important sectors of the, the Syrian economy and Syrian trade. Um, and the sanctions uh, were, were delayed for six months. They went into effect finally in, in June. Um, hypothetically, at least, non-U.S. persons can continue to deal with purely civilian Syrian trade. So trade in which the Syrian government uh, is not involved remains permissible, generally. Uh, that said, in practice, it, it has now become difficult just because of the, uh, the presence of the Syrian government in much of the Syrian economy, and, uh, and many people have curtailed their whatever Syrian trade remains. Wanted to spend a minute on uh, Hong Kong, uh, the, uh, the new kid on the block. This is the, uh, the, the newest addition to the uh, uh, US sanctions pantheon. Uh, the Hong Kong uh, sanctions program was established only in July of this year. Uh, it was established in response to China's crackdown on uh, pro-democracy movement and civil liberties. Uh, as of right now, these sanctions are very limited. This is very different than uh, Iran and uh, Venezuela and Syria. Uh, the sanctions only target a handful of uh, Hong Kong governmental officials. And uh, um, and other uh, transactions with the with the Hong with both the Hong Kong government and Hong Kong private industry generally remain not subject to any sanctions. U.S. and non-U.S. persons generally can continue to do business with Hong Kong. Um, but that said, there is this is often just kind of the first step. So we'll uh, we'll have to pay very close attention as to any further sanctions uh, developments. Um, very briefly on the, uh, 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 on, on the current sanctions, uh, non-U.S. persons who deal with these sanctioned uh, officials are potentially at risk, uh, and this does set up the potential for a, uh, uh, a fun and difficult uh, conflict of law issue where Hong Kong has issued some guidance saying you can't comply with these sanctions if you're in Hong Kong and the U.S. requires you, and so uh, for anyone who has to deal with these officials, they might run into some problems. Um, I wanted to spend some time talking about the, uh, the OFAC Maritime Advisory. Uh, this has been uh, uh, long in the works and it finally was released on May, May 14th. And this is, this is obviously very important because this is a, an advisory, uh, 20, 25 pages or so uh, of, of detailed guidance uh, to the maritime community. Um, it's, it's couched in the language of suggestion, but this, this is really more of a mandate than a suggestion. OFAC really wants you to, uh, to comply with this. 
Um, the uh, the the uh, I I think the the first and the main takeaway from the advisory is OFAC's position at this point is really the entire world, everyone in the everyone in the shipping community, U.S. and non-U.S. needs to pay attention to to U.S. sanctions. Um, I think this is something that uh, a lot of people had come to this conclusion over the past few years on their own. Um, but it's kind of helpful for OFAC to, to just say it and say this is our official policy. Uh, OFAC really does want every shipping uh, company in the world and every other company involved in shipping, not just shipping companies, to have sanctions compliance policies, to uh, know your customer, uh, due diligence, have language in your contracts, do, do et cetera. Uh, a lot of the things that most people have been doing already, but, um, but this is now kind of formal policy. Uh, I'd say the big new focus uh, that, that the advisory highlights. One is on uh, AIS transponders. Uh, there's a general uh, IMO requirement that transponders be on at all times. Um, there, but there may be times when the service fails and they just cease to broadcast for, for because they lose a signal. Um, and then there are maybe legitimate re safety reasons for turning off a transponder, mainly piracy risk. You don't want to tell the pirates where you are. Um, and the advisory essentially says that any turning off of as transponders should be monitored and flagged. Uh, the other hard one is ship-to-ship -ship transfers. Um, despite numerous uh, uh, people in the shipping community doing their best to convince OFAC that ship-to-ship -ship transfers are uh, very much a normal part of shipping and there's nothing, the, the overwhelming majority of ship-to-ship -ship transfers do not involve any level of sanctions evasion, um, OFAC is certainly concerned that, that this does create a risk of sanctions evasion and, uh, and they, they advise caution. Um, I wanted to talk about two very, very recent, just in, within the past couple months, uh, OFAC enforcement actions. Uh, OFAC frequently publishes their enforcement actions, uh, which are often very interesting because they give you a little bit of insight into where uh, OFAC is thinking, uh, uh, into what OFAC is thinking about. Um, in just last month, uh, Deutsche Bank Trust Company America, the U.S. Uh, subsidiary of Deutsche Bank, was fined $157,000. And you might say in the grand scheme of things, that's certainly not a lot of money. And you'd be right, of course, it's not a lot of money. Um, but, but the facts are very, are very worrying. Um, they processed a payment for fuel oil and OFAC's claim is that there was a Cyprus company that was under uh, Russian sanctions and that Cyprus company had an interest in the fuel oil. And you say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean they had an interest? Well. They didn't own the fuel oil. There's no evidence that they touched the money. There's no evidence that they were anywhere in the direct, in the direct chain of, uh, of control. Um, the evidence suggests that they did own the fuel oil at some point in the past, and then they sold it to the, this company. Um, but just, just think about the potential implications of this. Obviously, there's a lot here that's going on under the radar, and this is very fact specific, and we don't know what the facts were. Um, there, there may be some much worse facts that aren't released. Um, but the, the implication of this is you're doing business with any non-sanctioned person anywhere in the world and then someone comes back and says, well, you know, they did business with a sanctioned person and now you're, you're in trouble and you're going to get fined. Um, so it's, it's a very worrying uh, implication um, and I think we should all just be aware of it. Uh, I wanted to close uh, before the last slide on a very different uh, topic, but I, I just love this and I had to, uh, had to mention it. Uh, there was a US uh, individual uh, in Colombia who entered into a romantic relationship with a sanctioned drug trafficker and was subject to sanctions for buying uh, that person, the genders are obscured, we don't know if it was a man or a woman, but uh, jewelry, meals, clothing, hotel rooms, and other gifts. Uh, so I think the takeaway is if you're in a foreign port and you, uh, and you meet that special someone, maybe do a background check. For my last slide, I wanted to, uh, to gaze into my crystal ball, uh, which is uh, as to the U upcoming US presidential election and see what the future might hold. Um, the answer is it's murky. Um, but if, uh, but I want, first of all, I just wanted to say if Trump wins, um, I would just expect more of the same, more of what we've seen over the past few years, which is very aggressive sanctions. Um, if Biden wins, uh, just looking at some of uh, Joe Biden's public statements, uh, he has publicly stated that he would rejoin the JCPOA and try to undo what Trump has done. Uh, I would caution uh, two things. First of all, uh, there's been so much damage, so much mistrust over the past uh, uh, two years after Trump, uh, after the U.S. left the JCPOA. I think it would be 
very difficult to just restart and pick up things uh, and pretend that nothing had happened over the past couple years. Um, and the second thing is that the original JCPOA faced tremendous uh, domestic U.S. political pressure by various uh, various interest groups, uh, and I, I, I would expect that any uh, attempts to restart it would face similar pressure. Uh, on Venezuela, in contrast, uh, Biden's general position has been pretty much in line with the uh, uh, with, with President Trump's position. He supports the sanctions. He opposes the government of Nicolas Maduro. Um, so at least based on his public statement, I, I would not expect many changes there. Uh, I haven't talked much about Cuba and Russia today because there hasn't been a lot new in the past year. Um, but very generally, uh, uh, Cuba, uh, uh, I think of Cuba as kind of a pendulum, depending on who's in office, we... Uh, uh, we see a little easing of sanctions, a little uh, tightening of sanctions, uh, and Biden has generally indicated he desires to go back to the Obama era detente with Cuba. Uh, and finally, with Russia, not entirely clear as to what President, uh, a President Biden's uh, positions would be, um, but I would just point out that there are several statutes and there's, there's a lot of political pressure which will make it uh, very difficult to undo a lot of the U.S. sanctions on Russia. So at the very least, that would be hard. Thank you very much. Oh, well, sorry, one more point uh, before before I start, uh, uh, um, uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, please save any Q&A for the end uh, and we'd be happy to answer them then. Thank you. Well, good morning or uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to speak today about force majeure and, and frustration uh, in commercial and shipping contracts under English law. Um, and it's particularly important, actually, because the two linked topics, uh, you know, with, with what, what, what go, what's going on with regards to COVID-19 and also sanctions that Daniel's just spoken about, they're, they're two concepts that have become important, uh, particularly important today. Starting with force majeure. Um, what is it? I mean, well, basically, it's an extraordinary event um, that's beyond the control of either party to a contract, and it excuses compliance by the parties with the contract obligations. And so you've got common examples being war, uh, strike, riot, crime, epidemic, so that's particularly important in these uh, times of COVID-19, or an act of God. What it doesn't uh, cover is negligence. If you have negligence, then the other party to the contract, or the, the one that's hard done by, would be looking, if it's not the negligent one, to be uh, uh, claiming in damages uh, for the other party's breach. It doesn't cover usual or natural events. It doesn't cover events that are contemplated by the contract. It really does deal with extreme events beyond the party's control. Now the other important thing to bear in mind is that under English law there's no concept of force majeure. So if you've got a contract and it's governed by English law, there will be, you'll have no force majeure unless your contract says so. So if you have COVID-19, you have delays and suddenly you can't perform your obligations, well if it's not spelled out by the contract, uh, you've got a problem. So you need to have a force majeure clause in your contract. So what is the most common clause? Well, the, com the most detailed clause that I've seen, and I've tended to see this in, um, in uh, contracts for sale of cargoes, is the ICC force majeure clause of 2020. Actually, there's a long clause, it's about three pages long, um, and there's a much shorter clause. You'll probably be happy to know. I'm just going to give you the uh, brief sort of um, bullet points um, emerging from the uh, longer clause. And what you have are seven named categories of events. It's very, very broad, but they include things like embargoes and sanctions. So that's what Daniel's just been talking about. Um, you've got an act of an authority uh, and or an epidemic. So then you're thinking about COVID-19. Um, and if one of these events prevents or impedes a party from performing one or more of its contract obligations, then the clause will be triggered if that party can prove that the impediment is beyond 
its reasonable control. Secondly, it could not have foreseen that event at the time of the contract. And thirdly, it could not reasonably have avoided or overcome the effect of that impediment. So if you've got those necessary uh, ingredients, then the clause is triggered. But what else does the clause say? Well, the clause says that the party wanting to rely on it has to notify the other party of that without delay. If it doesn't, then it won't be able to rely on the clause. Now, it also, the clause also says that the party seeking to rely on the clause, if it has gone through all of those hoops, is excused from performance of its obligations, even if the impediment is just temporary. But it also has some draconian effects. It says the contract can be terminated if the impediment substantially deprives the parties of what they were reasonably expecting to receive. So right there, you have significant scope for a dispute. Because basically, what does that mean? What is a substantial deprivation of what the parties were expect, reasonably expecting to receive? What's substantial? What's not? You also um, can have the ter contract terminated if the impediment lasts for 120 days. The party also who's trying to invoke the clause has to try to mitigate the effect of the force majeure event, if it can. And also what the clause says is that the party, if there is a party, benefiting from the impediment, then it has to pay the other party for that benefit. So spanning three pages, you have a very detailed clause, the deep, most detailed one I've seen, that spells out when it does and doesn't apply. What about time charter parties? Let's go to shipping contracts. Well, the simple answer is that you don't tend to have force majeure clauses. Um, what I have seen is a force majeure-ish clause, but not much of one, um, and that's clause 16 of the 1946 edition of the uh, NYPE form, uh, for the time charter of a ship. I'm not going to read out all of the uh, force majeure events, but you can see some of the uh, ones that were appearing before an act of God, um, uh, fire, restraint of princes, rulers, accidents of the seas, um, basically what this clause does is if there's one of the events that occur and it's not with the negligence of either party, then then a party, if the other one suffers a loss, the other party is exempt uh, from uh, being liable in damages um, for losses that flow if they're, if, they're, if, this, if they're brought about by this event. But that's about the extent of what you have in a time charter party. But about voyage charter parties? Well, if in the standard forms you don't have uh, force majeure uh, clauses, so if you want one, you have to uh, stick one in. And I've given an example of a, uh, you know, a fairly detailed force majeure clause in a, in a type voyage time charter party context in a recent reported case of Classic versus Limbungan. And so what you have are I've split them up into their numbered ingredients. It says that the owner of the ship, or the charter, or the ship, or the receiver, none of them are going to be liable for loss or damage, um, or failure to supply, or load, or discharge, or deliver the cargo, if that results from any of the listed events in little number two. And I've highlighted some events that are uh, quite um, uh, quite topical now, so you've got epidemics, COVID-19, quarantine, COVID-19, and the intervention of the sanitary customs or other constituted authorities. Again, if it's due to COVID-19, you're looking at this being triggered. Or any other causes beyond the owners or charterers or shippers or receivers control, very wide. Um, and of course, it adds in middle number three that, of course, uh, the events have to directly affect the performance of either party under the charter party. Um, but basically, with all of these, you know, with COVID-19 in particular, um, we find ourselves now with BIMCO um, for the first time drafting a force majeure clause for shipping contracts. Unfortunately, that's all we actually know about it. We're waiting to see uh, what emerges from this. Um, but we can expect to see this clause emerge, and I would expect it's going to be for 
at least voyage charter parties, I would have thought shipbuilding contracts, but let's wait and see. And speaking of shipbuilding contracts, well, what do they uh, typically say? Well, the main two forms, the New Build Con and the SAJ forms, um, actually do deal with force majeure. What they do is they say, if you have a, one of the named force majeure events that's beyond uh, the reasonable control of the parties, then if you have delay resulting from this, that, that's called permissible delay, and that permits the yard to postpone the delivery date for the period of that permissible delay. And it goes on to say that if the permissible delay continues for a certain number of days, the buyer of the, uh, of the ship under construction may have the right to cancel the contract. Of course, the yard, if it wants to uh, rely on this, must prove a few things. That's to prove the delayed construction of the ship, it has to prove that it's beyond the party's reasonable control, and it also, under the clause, must notify the buyer of the event and of when the event ends. I've just made a little note here of uh, how COVID-19 can fall within particular words and qualify as a force majeure event under the new build con standard form or the SAJ form. Um, so there you have COVID-19 actually catered for in a shipbuilding contract uh, context. But what about um, contracts for the, the sale of second-hand ships, MOAs? Well, you don't find force majeure uh, clauses in such contracts. If you want to have one, you have to include a tailor-made clause. Um, but I am actually seeing, um, as a disputes lawyer, I'm seeing COVID-19 clauses now being inserted in contracts because what do you do if you can't deliver the ship at the required place because of COVID-19? Um, it has been happening, so you know, best to cater for that. So that's force majeure. Now a vaguely linked concept is frustration. What is that? Well, basically it's a uh, very extreme uh, form of force majeure, but it has different consequences. What it does is it means that a contract can be automatically brought to an end automatically brought to an end if you've got an extraneous event and it's outside the control by the party it's also beyond the scope of the express contract terms regarding risk and responsibility so so far quite you know, quite like force majeure and it risk and results in the impossibility of the performance of the contract as per its terms or it results in the impossibility of the contract's commercial purpose so we English lawyers say that it's the contract's now radically different from what was originally agreed. Similarly to force majeure, it can't be self-induced. If it's self-induced, self then you're looking at damages for a contract breach. Also, mere delay, or even excessive delay, or even hardship or financial loss. That's not sufficient. And just to give you an example, um, I've uh, just cited here the uh, leading English law court decision on that, the Sea Angel, um, where you had um, salvors, Greek salvors, subledies, um, and they time chartered a ship, the Sea Angel, for up to 20 days to take cargo from a grounded tanker which had caused oil pollution. So it was taking the cargo off the tanker by way of ship to ship transfer. And the redelivery of the Sea Angel that it had time chartered was delayed by four months, unfortunately, because the port said, well, I'm not granting port clearance until the oil pollution charges are paid. So it's a lady said, well, I'm not paying the hire because the contract's being frustrated, right? Well, wrong, said the judge, because he said, this risk of detention was a foreseeable and known risk. You just didn't provide for it in the contract. You can't have frustration uh, for this. That's not what frustration is there for. Frustration is there for something extreme. So for example, I've had a case where uh, my contract was uh, held to be frustrated where the ship had suffered a casualty and could not take the cargo to destination um, and it was held to have been, the contract at least, to have been frustrated. So that's when it can apply. So wrapping these two linked concepts up, bearing in mind uh, things like COVID-19, 
or sanctions. Force majeure. Well, if you want it in your contract, uh, you've got to you've got to put it in your contract because otherwise it's not going to apply as a matter of English law. And if you want it to apply properly, the more detailed the clause, the better. Frustration, very difficult to show, almost never. And so, in short, uh, that's the effect of those uh, two types of uh, uh, legal concepts. Again, if you've got any questions, I'd uh, be happy to uh, answer them at the uh, end of this webinar. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Today, Gary and I are looking at market trends and changes in documentation. There are a number of topics that we could have spoken to you about today, the most recent ones including DAC6 and the electronic signing, but we're going to focus on two subjects which are very topical at present. I'm going to look at the finance of sustainable shipping, and Gary's going to go on and focus on LIBOR replacement. So I'll start with market trends and developing themes that we're seeing in the sustainable finance space. I'll then go on and provide a brief update on the Poseidon principles. I'll speak briefly about ship recycling and then finally just mention the sea cargo charter. It's very clear that there is an ESG revolution afoot at present which ties in with increasing regulation and compliance requirements which apply to the shipping industry more generally. There's an increasing focus on things like anti-bribery, KYC, sanctions, the Modern Slavery Act, ship recycling and scrapping, and all aspects of ESG, including gender equality, seafarers' rights in terms of the current crew repatriation crisis, broad diversity, decarbonisation, which in turn has led to a rise in green bonds and other sustainability-linked features in financing. Whilst a lot of this is relatively new for shipping, in some ways, shipping is well set up for handling the ESG reporting because shipping companies are used to handling technical data, classification requirements, and using management systems for dealing with numbers and technical requirements. Financiers may be able to expand the names that they can lend to if certain green criteria are met. This is likely to continue as it becomes more of a focal point for lenders and investors. Lenders certainly have an appetite to finance more efficient ships and new fuel adoption methods and technology. Some tension arises from the fact that typically lenders and owners require a proven track record to back up an investment. And here the technology is still nascent and there can be uncertainties around costs and return to capital. Increasingly, banks are taking green advisory roles in loans being documented in this space. The typical features of sustainability linked financings, which we've been involved in, are price adjustment features linked to a borrower's performance on carbon emission reduction in conformance with the IMO's targets for GHG reductions and other environmental and social initiatives. Other key performance indicators, KPIs being considered and discussed are board diversity, gender in terms of women cadets, but the key feature to date has been the link to carbon emissions. Until now, we've seen only small pricing adjustments, although this, these will probably become more significant as the competition in this space increases, and even small adjustments still provide sufficient incentive to many borrowers, particularly if the sustainability features align with their own internal policies in this regard. A few trends to note in terms of negotiation of provisions. There is an increase in the use of third party experts to identify the KPIs and to report on them during the life of the loan. This is regarded as key to prevent greenwashing, giving the false impression or providing misleading information about how a company is meeting its green objectives. Consideration is also being given to how to ensure KPIs remain ambitious and meaningful to the borrower over the course of the loan, especially for those with longer tenors. Both lenders and borrowers should have an ongoing role in monitoring and updating the ESG provisions. There's been some discussion as to consent levels for changes to KPIs and whether a borrower can revoke them without lender consent. There may be margin uplifts where KPIs are not met, and there has been suggestion that these uplifts should be paid to designated charities or projects. We haven't seen this happening yet, but it is something people are focused on. 
Typically, a breach of an ESG provision will not generally be an event of default. There is a consensus that borrowers cannot confidently meet targets and the risk of defaults and cross defaults seems unbalanced, particularly when, to a certain extent, the situation is outside of their control. In addition, there would be an event of default anyway if there was a breach of green legislation. It's a bit of a balancing act, as there's no point putting in covenants which have no teeth and no consequences if the requirements are not met. This is why the margin ratchet seems to be a sensible way to deal with defaults, using the reduction in costs as a carrot to incentivize borrowers. The final point to note here is that notwithstanding the health pandemic, ESG remains firmly on the agenda. And if there's any, if anything, the focus has picked up pace on this. Turning to the Poseidon principles, I won't go into too much detail on how they operate simply because this has been spoken about quite a lot in the past. Just a few points to note in general terms. It's been impressive how quickly the initiative has taken off and how many ship financiers have responded to the call to action. They were launched in 2019 and the initiative now consists of 18 lending institutions with a shipping portfolio of around $150 billion who've committed to align their lending policies with climate consideration. In our experience, ship owners have responded positively to being asked to hand over their data and generally we've seen some negotiation of the clauses but not too much resistance. The key development to note is that we've just gone through the first reporting year. By the end of November, the individual members' alignment trajectories as of 2019 will be announced, giving the first holistic view of where a considerable chunk of the global shipping fleet stands and how some of the key industry lenders are performing emissions-wise. The Poseidon Principles Initiative has received much attention and plaudits for its pioneering approach to sustainable finance, but the next few months will lay bare the work that needs to be done. The Poseidon principles do, however, offer lenders another factor by which to assess the quality of shipping rather than just the age of the vessel. It may allow charters and lenders to extend the life of the existing fleet and prevent good tonnage from being scrapped or for more tonnage being built still using old technology. Moving on to ship recycling, this subject has been something parties have focused on since the sea trade case, which was the watershed moment. I'm not going to say too much on that case simply because, again, a lot has been said about it in the past. But I did want to talk about a recent development, which is the July 2020 judgment, when the High Court refused to strike out a claim for negligence brought by a widower against the defendant in relation to the death of her husband, which occurred whilst he was work working on the demolition of an oil tanker in Bangladesh. In this case, the court refused to strike out a claim for negligence without going to trial. In coming to this conclusion, the court considered a number of points, such as firstly, whether the defendant had control to influence where a ship was eventually scrapped, for example, by adjusting the sale price. Secondly, whether companies that sell their vessels into Bangladesh should be liable to compensate workers who suffer injury or death as a result. And thirdly, the robustness of contractual clauses stipulating demolitions should take place in an environmentally sound manner and in accordance with the health and safety working practices. The decision is significant as it provides further confirmation that a ship owner's liability may not end at the end of sale for scrapping. The, the court rejected the defendant's submission that since most vessels ended up in South Asia, it followed that the defendant was merely following standard practice on the basis that if standard practice was inherently dangerous, it cannot be condoned as sound and rational, even if almost everyone does the same. The court's findings here is in line with an increasingly expansive attitude towards potential liability for operations in other jurisdictions. Implications of this decision for the maritime sector are twofold. First, the court's comments indicate that intergroup contractual and management structures commonly used in the shipping industry with a view to containing, containing liability come under pressure in this context. And secondly, there's now a very real risk of legal liability attaching in circumstances where a company no longer has an interest in the vessel in question. This is in addition to the usual reputational risks that come with being associated even at arm's length with such an incident. 
it would be prudent for those involved in the sale of end-of-life vessels to make explicit reference in the transaction documents to meeting the standards set out in the EU Ship Recycling and Hong Kong Conventions as applicable. It's also worth noting that non-EU flagged vessels sold for scrapping whilst in European waters are still required to comply with EU and or UK regulations. Just moving finally on to speak very briefly about the Sea Cargo Charter. This was launched last week on the 7th of October. Its purpose is to establish a framework for assessing and disclosing the climate alignment of chartering activities in the bulk sector, consistent with the IMO. It's intended to have a wide scope, with it being envisaged to also apply to parties contracting for the sale and purchase of commodities, where their counterparts at some point in the contractual chain are expected to become charterers. It has many similarities to the Poseidon Principles Initiative. For example, upon becoming a signatory to it, parties will use best endeavours to ensure their counterparties comply with it. The requirement to assess climate alignment comes into effect in the following calendar year, after the calendar year in which that party became a signatory. Finally, just to note, this initiative comes from the chartering community, and as with the Poseidon Principles, the charterers are relying on the disponent owner to provide the relevant information through standard covenants that will be included in the charter documentation. Its alignment with the Poseidon Principles is no coincidence. Both are ultimately part of a larger framework to achieve decarbonisation goals and deliver on sustainable shipping. Thank you for listening. I'll now hand over to Gary. He'll talk about LIBOR replacement before we then move on to the Q&A section. Uh, thank you, Kavita. So I'm going to be talking about the search for a replacement for LIBOR with a risk-free interest rate benchmark. As you know, screen rates underpin the interest rates payable on numerous financial contracts, including debt financing in the maritime sector. And we all know about the manipulation of LIBOR in the past and now the work that is being undertaken to find a risk-free alternative. After 2021, LIBOR is very likely to cease to be available and other markets are also phasing out their equivalent rates. So what is the alternative to using LIBOR as the interest rate benchmark? Uh, for US dollars, the replacement rates will be very likely to be based on SOFRA, which is the secured overnight financing rate. Uh, this is a broad measure of the cost of borrowing cash overnight collateralized by treasury securities and by reference to how much interest a bank has to repay to its lender on the following day. Uh, there are four software rates under consideration which you can see listed in the slide. Um, I don't intend to go into any detail on that, but um, at present the focus is on software compounded in arrears and on the 22nd of July 2020, the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, the ARCC, released conventions related to compounded software in arrears in syndicated loans. And the ARCC has just, on the 10th of September 2020, issued an RFP for administrators to publish forward-looking software. So we'll need to see what happens uh, in this respect. Uh, so at present, um, our LMA documents include replacement screen rate concepts. The LMA drafting essentially deals with the mechanics of agreeing a replacement or additional rate well before LIBOR disappears. It isn't drafting to apply any replacement automatically, such as a software-based formula. Uh, in August 2020, the LMA, LMA issued a supplement to the replacement of the screen rate clause to try to address the renegotiation process and the move from LIBOR to a risk-free rate. So the LMA wording does provide an early trigger for dealing with replacement of LIBOR, but not the terms on how the replacement benchmark operates. So the NMA have also issued exposure drafts of a uh, multi-currency facility incorporating a rate switch agreement directly to a compounded RFR, so a risk-free rate, and also an exposure draft of a compounded software-based US dollar term and revolving facility. 
and the NMA are intending to produce further documents relating to SOFRA. So they've been very active in the uh, transition process and they have a very helpful uh, microsite on their website. So the purpose of the LMA exposure draft is to provide a focal point for consideration and discussion in the market of how the new benchmarks will operate. Uh, so there are various considerations that have been looked at in the exposure drafts and which will need to be considered, um, such as you know, how software is calculated, you know, will it be compounded in arrears, uh, when does a calculation period start? Um, on an early repayment, uh, what time periods need to be taken into account to calculate accrued interest? And then two, two main issues are the, the break costs. So what are or do lenders now suffer any break costs uh, given they're not going to be funding on an overnight basis? Uh, what are the early repayment costs? And what are the market disruption issues? Um, you know, the parties need to consider whether risk-free rates have the same underlying funding considerations of LIBOR. So there are plenty of details to be worked out and um, the aim is to come together with a preferred methodology and drafting which can be adopted by the market on a general basis. So what happens with loans that can't be renegotiated to implement a new benchmark? So the Her Majesty's Treasury and the FCA are considering how LIBOR can be replaced where the parties don't agree a replacement risk-free rate. The first position is to aim for an active transition away from the LIBOR benchmark. But tough, tough legacy deals um, and the HMT and FCA guidance would only apply where there's no realistic option of contracts being amended to replace the LIBOR benchmark with a risk-free rate. And to this end, on the 23rd of June 2020, the UK HMT issued proposals to amend the UK benchmark regulation. So this is potentially giving powers to, F to the FCA to change the methodology of LIBOR. And we're expecting further details on this in due course. In the context of the maritime sector deals that we see, there are practical shipping specific issues. Uh, one of those is that a number of flag jurisdictions do require ship mortgages to be updated when there are changes to the underlying deal, which were not anticipated in the original drafting. So, you know, as usual, it needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, but the move away from LIBOR base rates could potentially result in amendments being needed to mortgages. Ideally, parties want to avoid this, given the amount of admin that's going to land on the borrowers and the bank's desks, and we're in active discussions with ship registries to lobby those registries to amend the underlying laws in those jurisdictions to avoid the requirement to amend mortgages. So what are we seeing in practice at the moment? Well, we're seeing some larger corporate borrowers are leading the way and Royal Dutch Shell has just entered into a $10 billion facility under English law, which is based on the LMA exposure draft software facility. So the move to new benchmarks is happening and regulators are very keen to ensure the move is still made. And on the, in the banking sector, the LMA is continuing to produce exposure drafts and is actively assisting the market with the move away from LIBOR and other benchmarks. So I'm now gonna hand over to George, who can lead the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, Gary, and, and to all our presenters. And um, thank you also for, for everyone who submitted questions. Now, we will deal with the questions in a minute, but but given that it's likely that we're going to overrun the scheduled time, so we were scheduled to, to uh, complete at the hour, which is in four minutes, I just want to provide a quick wrap up. So, um, you know, I'd like to thank, as I said, all the presenters and everyone for participating and joining today. What we would like to do for those who have joined today, we would like you to send uh, an email to the events at WFW.com um, address so that we're aware that you joined and so that we can send you slides and um, the slides from these presentations so that you have those. 
Now, we will also be sending together with the slides a link um, to some of the art articles and also um, a short feedback survey. And we'd be very grateful if you could complete that survey and return it to us. Also, if you, I'd like to also mention that we have episode two of this series, which is due to take place on the 3rd of November, a Tuesday. And that session will cover key considerations of workouts, restructuring, and enforcement, as well as leasing. And finally, if there's anyone listening in now who are um, interested in details of the full transport webinar series, which also, other than maritime, focuses on rail and aviation, uh, please visit our website, WFWCon, and you'll find details there. Now, turning now to the questions, um, as I said, we, we have quite a lot of them, to be honest. Some of them will answer live, or I'll ask the, the presenters to, to respond to live. Others, we will, we will uh, type an answer to the, uh, to the people who've, who've asked them. The, the first question I have, um, which I think is very interesting, and I, I expect that many people will be interested to, to, to know what our view is on this, is directed to Daniel Pulaski. And that is, how far are banks and other financiers expected to go in asking borrowers to look into group members and related entities and affiliates of related entities in terms of determining whether a party is a sanctioned person? And it concludes by saying, obviously, there could be issues further down the line, but how far is it reasonably expected for lenders to go and include things into sanctions language in contracts? So uh, uh, thank you for the, for the question. It's an excellent question. Um, and the answer is uh, yeah, the, the, there's certainly there's no precise answer. Uh, there's no there's no point where you say this is the exact amount of due diligence that you need to do and then you can stop and then you're fine and, and same thing with contractual language. Um, but these are precisely the types of questions that uh, that those in the shipping community should be uh, confronting uh, uh, as an institutional matter. Uh, I think the answer to the first question, how much diligence is you uh, uh, you have a sanctions compliance policy, you put into that sanctions compli compliance policy uh, what you can what you view based on your industry, based on your industry the, uh, ties, your clients, everyone else you're dealing with, uh, as as to what is reasonable that you can expect, but doesn't uh, overly hamper your ability to actually do your business. Uh, and similar with sanctions language, uh, you have model sanctions language in your uh, in your loan agreements, let's say, um, but then often you're going to have to negotiate them because other people are going to object, and then you have these questions. And, but these are, the answer is these are the questions that we deal with all the time. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, there is a question for Kavita, um, wh which is, what points have we seen being negotiated by borrowers on the Poseidon principal provisions? Thanks, George. Um, I think the, the, the main points that we see sort of come up or concerns that we see come up on from the owner and borrower side on the Poseidon principles has been sort of concerns around confidentiality. Uh, and, and just sort of their data being dealt with in a confidential manner. And then the main, the main point that really frequently comes up is just what it means to say that you're going to provide all information necessary for a lender to comply with the Poseidon principles, because obviously the, the principles can change and, and the requirements can change. And so borrowers are sort of wary of the impact of future amendments to Poseidon principles. So we've seen quite a lot of um uh, sort of negotiation where people are trying to limit the language to just amendments to reflect the legal and regulatory requirements that are mandatory thank you kavita um we have, there's also another a, a question for gary this time which is do you think borrowers will actively engage in the process of agreeing an alternative to LIBOR, to the LIBOR base rate in facility agreements that they may have signed 
some years ago. I, I thank you, George. Yeah, I think I think they probably will have to because the the alternative is to to look at the existing agreements, which probably have the the usual um, fallback provisions for when LIBOR isn't available, which ultimately will probably revert to a negotiated position, which you know, which will um, possibly not be acceptable to the to the um, to the borrowers. Therefore, if that isn't acceptable to the borrowers, then the, the other alternative is to move across to the RFRs. So I think there's probably going to be quite a lot of incentive to for borrowers to move across to a a, a market standard RFR. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, we have one more question for, for Daniel, which relates to um, AIS transporters. And um, the question is, who is supposed to be doing the monitoring or, and flagging, and what does flagging actually mean? So it, uh, uh, it depends on, uh, on, on whose ship it is. Um, if it's your ship, if, if, uh, if you're the ship owner or, uh, or charterer or you really have control over the ship, um, anytime the AIS goes down for, uh, for any uh, significant period, um, you, should, you should check and find out why it was. And maybe it was a technical failure, maybe there was a good reason, um, but, but somewhere you should put in some sort of files AIS went down, here's where the vessel was, this is why, and, and essentially so you have it if anyone asks you. Um, if you're dealing with someone else's ship, then that's the question you ask. Uh, if you're kind of doing diligence and you find uh, a somewhat suspicious AIS gap, you, you can ask and say, can you please explain this gap? And I mean, just, just to follow up on that, if you are a, a third party there and you've asked the question, so let's say that you're a lender and, and you've asked the question and you've received a, a response. What's the, you know, how can, how can a lender show that they've divested themselves of liability in terms of exploring, you know, the, the response? Or do you, are you, you just say, well, this is my customer, this is what they told me, um, and I relied on that? Yeah. So. Uh, the answer, unfortunately, and this relates to the last question is, the lend, no matter how much diligence you do and no matter what you put in your contract, you can never 100% divest yourself of, of liability without, without a doubt. Uh, you can be as careful as, you, as, as possible and still, and still run into trouble. Um, the, uh, um, uh, but what I would generally recommend if this is something, you know, if this is a concern and you're kind of do, doing diligence is you, you ask for the explanation uh, hopefully the explanation is one that makes sense and you say, yeah, I, I can understand that. And, and essentially you put something in your file and then if it turns out years later, someone is investigating this and it turns out that there was something bad going on, you can say, look, I, I did my diligence. I have a record of it. Uh, I really should be blameless here. Uh, and often that is the exact kind of thing that will either uh, avoid, uh, uh, avoid responsibility altogether uh, or uh, avoid fines altogether, or if there are going to be fines, it will minimize fines um, because the, these are the kind of kind of good factors that uh, causes OFAC to decrease the the amount of fines. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I'd like to thank again all the panelists and all of you for joining today. And if you have any other questions that you know, maybe sparked by the, by the presentations or the discussion we've had at the end from the Q&A. Uh, you are free, of course, to, um, uh, to channel those to, to my colleagues, so Daniel, Gary, Kavita, and Evangelos, or to the, to the events email, and we will try to respond to those. Um, and again, I'd like to thank you and remind you of the uh, second episode, which is going to take place on Tuesday, the 3rd of November. Thank you again. Bye-bye.